Mazul. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, here to usher you into a kind of a cloudy, rainy kind of day here in the Missoula Valley. Uh, we've been having a lot of smoke the last couple weeks with some of the fires that are happening in uh, basically all of western United States. Um, but it's been raining here in Missoula, so a lot of that uh, um, smoke has been kind of put down um, for the most part in the city of Missoula, but I've been seeing some haze start coming back into the city of Missoula. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show, but let's talk a little bit more about what's happening just in the news. Uh, Friday, as soon as my show premiered later that day, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died at 87. Uh, she was sworn in by former President Bill Clinton in 1993 and served until her death on September 18th of 2020 with uh, complications from ovarian cancer. Uh, while the Dems are mourning over the loss of Supreme Court judge, GOPs are looking to streamline her replacement. Uh, Dems are slowing the process, saying that this is no time to talk about replacing her. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell asked President Donald Trump to nominate the next Supreme Court justice. Dems have little to no way of stopping the nomination with a, with a minority in the Senate. By pushing through a confirmation vote between now and the next inauguration, McConnell would be violating the rule he articulated just four years ago against considering and confirming Supreme Court justice during an election year. So far, it seems that the latest play GOP senators have uh, driving up to this year's election, which may surprise many people on both sides. Of course... Let's, let's talk less about politics and more about some Montana news. One of the biggest uh, Montana news stories that happened uh, uh, back in 2017 was a uh, whitefish, a white supremacist, uh, um, white nationalist in the whitefish area. Um, one of the things that kind of happened is in Whitefish, a Jewish woman became the source of doxing from neo-Nazi website that resulted in a lawsuit of the curator of the Daily Stormer. The Daily Stormer is a alt-right uh, neo-Nazi website that was founded in 2013 by Andrew Anglin. Um, of course, since then, he has been the center of uh, fuel to alt-right groups to start troll storms and has been accused of inciting violence in 2017 at a white nationalist rally in Charlottesville. Um, Along with that, in 2019, a lawsuit was filed against England for doxing a black college student. Taylor Dumpson's uh, lawsuit said England directed his readers to a troll storm uh, after someone hung bananas with hateful messages from nooses in the university's campus a day after her May 2017 inauguration as student gov government president. It became uh, Montana news when Taylor Gersh and her family became targets of the troll storm. In a string of posts, England accused Gersh and other Jewish residents of Whitefish, Montana, of engaging in an extortion racket against the mother of a white nationalist, Richard Spencer. The ruling took place over a year, and now they will be awarded $14 million, $4 million in damages, and the other $10 million to them. Uh, and it orders to England to take the website down. Uh, England is an Ohio native, but has also been... Uh, failed to appear in court when summoned, and also has claimed to be out of the United States as well. So, um, and so far, has been difficult to track down, and he, and he has claims he is, does not live in the U.S. So let's talk about some Missoula news. Mountain Lion is looking to bump up their service uh, by on a upcoming election, uh, the, on the upcoming election in November, it's a ballot, a uh, $3 million bump to improve the system. Um, so, so far, you're paying about, uh, you'll be paying 81 more dollars a year, making it over $150 a year in taxes in terms of purchasing, uh, in terms of mountain line. Uh, ex uh, so what you would get from this is expanded weekend service, including adding Sunday bus services for the first time, increased bus frequency on heavily used routes, funding to enhance zero fare program. Buses go from diesel to electric to meet the 2035 zero uh, tailpipe emission goal, reducing vehicle emissions and protecting air, uh, air quality. Uh, this vote will be on the November belt this year. Most of this will be a push for more electric buses. And those are your news rundowns uh, for today. Um, I'll have a more in the show talking about what the city is doing. And uh, But before that, I have a pre-critic for you guys. But uh, even before that, um, I'm getting way ahead of myself. We got some new programs that are going to be airing on MCAT right now. They're the suffragettes. We're the suffragists. You call an American a suffragette, and you're really calling her a bra burner equivalent. It is not. It's a derogatory term in the United States. 
But um, um, Alice Paul, who had to spend some time in Europe, with, in England, with the suffragettes, who were quite militant. They went and threw herself in front of the king's horses and was killed. They slashed major artworks in art galleries saying, this artwork is more important to you than me as a human being. They took a whip at the prime minister. They um, were very militant. They went to prison, many of them, and so they paid. It was a very much a militant uh, approach to it. In the United States, that wasn't the case until Alice Paul organizes the Congressional Union becomes the Women's Party and then founds the Equal Rights Movement. They're the ones who say, we're going to chain ourselves to the White House because President Wilson won't listen to us. That was just unheard of. You, were, you just didn't do that. me kind of talking to myself in front of a camera, but who cares? Uh, but we cannot forget the movies that have us assassinated. Um, this time is our movie-going experience. Ava, A-V-A, a movie about a female assassin who is marked by death by her very own people who sent her out on her assassination mission. I guess they're just kind of covering their tracks. That's kind of what they got to do. But anyways, uh, twists and turns only to find the one person that she thought she could trust, she couldn't trust. But then she kind of trusts them, or they kind of have a redeeming thing, but then they die anyways because, you know, it's that movie. Uh, of course, I've seen this Gina Davis movie before. I've seen Atomic Blonde. I've seen these kind of movies before where you have a badass woman. Sorry about the language. Um, <laughs> but you see this. It's called Ava. Not the good one. Um, Shortcut. A. A. It's a horror movie called Shortcut. And that's basically kind of all tropes of all horror movies. It's like, hey, let's take this scary road. And this is what this movie is about. When you're in a horror film and you realize you should have not taken that turn, this is exactly what it is. Shortcut stars no one you know. So leave that box unchecked. But five teens, yes, teens. Uh, <laughs> teens. They're probably uh, between 25 and 30. But anyways, teens take a bus down to a desolate road, the shortcut road. Uh, wait, it's exactly how it sounds. A monster attacks, some die and others die, but only one survives at the end, only to be killed in the post-credit or just like, ah, I think I'm safe, Blah, dead, horror film. And anyways, um, shortcut. The only person who survives is the boring, um, worthless person. <laughs> so mean. All right, moving on. Let's talk about some video games. Uh, we're talking about some cash grab. Nintendo is not shy of uh, re-releasing a lot of their properties, and why not? It's uh, Super Mario All-Stars 3D Baby, starring Mario and Peach as the main a man uh, must save the princess from a giant snapping turtle daddy. Daddy. Oh, I'm sorry I said daddy. Uh, but we find a reptile attack the Mushroom Kingdom. Only Mario can defeat him again and again. And again, you get three games for the price of one full new game, but you play a lot of the old games. So enjoy uh, 3D Sagas from uh, Mario 64 to Mario Sunshine, where it gets basically a big water pump. And then finally, Mario Galaxy, where um, you're stuck on the physics of planets and stuff. It, you know, because, you know, when you run out of ideas, you send, you send them to the moon. You send them to the stars. You do all that stuff. Um, but enjoy these three games in one, but they are not new. Hey, but it beats uh, 
tracking down Nintendo's Wii's that are no longer uh, around, I think, in um, new copies. <sighs> Alright, we got a new dub and stuff for you guys. And it is from the film... I forget, but without further ado, here is the new <laughs> dub and stuff. Oh, Adventures of Superman. Stamp Day for School Children. We now turn to Superman selling stamps Arr. to children. All right, for the last time, you need stamps to send letters, packages, and all sorts of things. Don't just stare at me. I'm a person. A very strong person, no doubt. But a person nonetheless. And I demand some kind of respect from you kids. Do you understand that? <laughs> I like Superman. Yes, we know you love me, but let me make this clear, is that I'm trying to get you guys to buy stamps and make it your civic duty. Who's gonna write to your grandma on her deathbed? I know for sure that I'm not going to write her. <laughs> but if I had to, I would write your grandmother. She's a hard-working lady, and she's from one of the greatest generations of all time, from the 1920s. They survived an economic yeah. depression. I'm assuming people who were already poor, they didn't have to really worry about it as much as the people who had more to lose. In some ways, the more you lose, uh, the less you are. So, um, does anyone kind of understand what's uh, going on here? Because I'm kind of losing track. Okay, well, see you later. Do you understand what he was talking about? No, I don't understand. Wait, Superman! Oh, we, we don't understand what he's talking about. We are going to support the federal post office right we now. Are. Do it now. We are don't say it. Don't say it. Also, stamp by whatever compliant. you tell us to buy. Another day, another shameless promotion. <laughs> Hi, how you guys doing? I'm Lois Lane, and I have a lot to say about a lot of different things. Now you guys better listen, because I got the Did scoop of a lifetime. Did you cover Superman on Stamp Day? It was awesome. Superman was there. He was <laughs> selling out. <laughs> of course. Of course he was. He's Superman. He's here to sell to you. Don't you understand that? Oh, come on. Back me up, Clark. Do you really think that Superman... Well, in the newspaper business, a uh, picture is worth a thousand words. Oh. And what do you guys Ooh, think about thank that? You. You got some Whoa. primo oh, stamps, wow. courtesy. Well, these stamps better not go to Superman's head, I tell you what. Oh, they will, Lois, they will. As we get closer, it is time for your city council report, and let's kick things off with Mark Hicka Day, which happened on September 21st. Now here is uh, Brian Von Lossberg with the proclamation. Okay. Whereas the city of Missoula recognizes the importance of accurate and in-depth weather forecasting to protect all citizens of our community, and whereas from this day forward, September 21st will be recognized as Mark Hicka Weather Day, and whereas Mark Hicka brings more than three decades of forecasting experience, and a seal of approval from the American, and that should read Meteorological Society. I had to check. It's not the Metrological Society. Uh, to Montana. And whereas Mark Aker recognizes the passion Montanans have to enjoy the outdoors, he also recognizes the extreme weather conditions we face throughout the year, from heat to wildfires to snow to bitter cold. Mark Aker has pledged his career to making sure every forecast he provides is precise so that your family is safe as they plan their lives. Now, th now therefore... Mayor Engen um, of the city of Missoula and the state of Montana recognizes the 21st day of September 2020 as Mark Haka Weather Day. Congratulations, Mark. For those of you who don't know who Mark Haka is, he was a long-term um, uh, weather reporter for NBC um, KECI Montana. Um, he had a big impact with the Missoula community, and also he's been in a couple MCT shows. Um, He's engaged with the city of Missoula as well, but he's been pretty much Missoula's weatherman since the 90s, so a long time. Um, and also, um, during this time of September is also Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, which is the which the city read the proclamation. Molly, Molly Stopdale spoke out about ovarian cancer. Stopdale, I am an ovarian cancer survivor, and I'm so grateful for this proclamation today. Um, I'm an advocate leader for Montana, for the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance, and um, it's so important to get uh, public recognition like this for ovarian cancer because, um, as the proclamation mentioned, the symptoms can be very vague, and a lot of women are not aware of them. Um, I did want to mention that it's sort of especially gratifying to have a proclamation from Missoula because twice every year there is an ovarian cancer survivor's retreat that can't make a dream, 
We tend to be a little sea of teal, um, which is our cancer color. Walking through downtown Missoula, we've gone to MCT Productions together. We uh, have bought Rock and Rudy's out of certain souvenirs some years, I think. Um, and uh, it's always a real pleasure for me to welcome women from all across the country to Missoula and sort of act as a local tour guide while we get to know each other. So thank you very much for this proclamation today. All right, moving on. Let's talk about a lot of these developments that are happening. Scott Street development is in the works, but there's been a lot of things being built on the north side. Um, it was an, as a kind of a mixed residential industrial zone as it's slowly transferring over to more of a residential commercial area for a lot of uh, buildings to be built. And Scott Street is looking to rezone into the two, the whole new Title 20 downtown master plan growth inwards. I won't go into too, too much about it, but let's have, um, so, uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about um, the new tap room that's being opened up where the former Perkins was in Missoula. Cassie Tipper, Development Services, talks a little bit more about that right now. On the left, you can see the existing facade facing North Reserve Street. You can see that currently there is a lack of landscaping along the facade and in the landscape island. The Title 20 landscaping chapter was not triggered by the proposed development. The applicant will be voluntarily landscaping the site and existing parking lot islands. Uh, the second photo shows an existing entrance to the rear of the building. The applicant is proposing to create a vestibule around the entrance to serve the casino portion of the development. So, so far, the, the, the uh, tavern owner wants to have a casino in the building, um, conditional use on the site. So think of a tap room. Uh, with microbrews and add a casino element. I can't really place exactly what it's going to look, look like, but imagine if Lucky Lil's and um, Draftworks um, had a baby uh, that couldn't sell liquor or wine. Anyways, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, they have a couple renderings of what the site's going to look like. Uh, the, um, the person who bought the property is basically looking to um, work on the facade, and this is kind of like the plans that they have rendered. So here is what they'll look like. The updated facade was approved for design excellence and complies with design excellence requirements such as glazing, street facing entry, and siding materials. And here are some additional renderings. Um, in the picture on the lower right side, you can see the proposed vestibule for the casino entry. But enough about a breakfast food place I used to go to after uh, band concerts. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the Riverfront Triangle, a huge, huge uh, push. Um, it's a huge uh, development that's been kind of on the back burner for a long time. And if you don't know what a Riverfront Triangle is, it is right next to uh, Taco John's in the Broadway downtown area. Um, and, the, and Jordan Hess uh, speaks to the motion into approving development. Rezoning is um, compliant with our growth policy, um, making making it a, um, a strategic rezone um, for um, that that meets our planning goals. It's um, in the downtown area, which is exactly where we um, would like to see uh, thoughtful density, um, and um, it also helps accomplish um, some of our goals uh, by by retaining the uh, riverfront, riverfront trail aspect of the of the former uh, zoning district. Uh, we can expect new commercial uh, buildings with the uh, added trail. So the part of this is that they want to emphasize more of the trail to connect to, uh, you know, Broadway, Karis Park, um, up to um, Kiwanis and the Milwaukee Trail. It's a big chunk of that trail that kind of gets cut off as soon as you get to the hospital parking lot or the future former uh, hospital parking lot. It's a, it's a whole parking lot that they kind of moved over across the street for the St. Pat's Hospital. And there, yeah, so there's a lot of land that's kind of being up for development, and that's kind of what's going on with that. This, they've been talking about this since 1980. There's just so much in this whole area. Riverfront Triangle, and um, what, there, there have been a couple concerns about many people being like, hey, if you build too many high buildings, how can you see the river? And let me just tell you, if you're on Broadway and you can see the river, you are really tall, because look at this image. That's what it looks like right as it is right now. You can't even see the river. So don't worry about not being able to see the river because you can't. <laughs> um, all right, so the reason why you're probably watching my city council is Heron's Landing. So if you don't know what Heron's Landing is, it is a new development off of George Elmer Drive slash 44 Ranch Estates. Um, this is a huge uh, development that they're uh, proposing. Um, 
they're building higher density homes and a lot of um, homes that are nearby, especially for for ranch estates, there's a single home on a, a solid acre of land, which is which isn't necessarily unheard of uh, 30 years ago. But nowadays, with a lot of uh, high density development and the whole growth re growth inner policy the city is doing, uh, Dave DeGranpe from the developer uh, speaks about the area. Uh, in the motions for annexation and the subdivision approval is to ensure that the um, the motion includes conditions as amended by city council. And I can put that up on, on the screen if you'd like. Again, that's annexation and also subdivision with uh, recommended conditions of approval as amended by city council. Uh, one of the things that they continue to talk about was the neighborhood overlay. And so for those of you who don't know what an the uh, neighborhood overlay, it was uh, an ordinance that was passed a couple years ago for the university neighborhood, but they wanted to see how they could apply it to areas within the city. Uh, this is a huge uh, process as well because Heron's Landing net is not only... Um, far out into more of the county land, but it's also a, a process that, of development, annexation within the city of Missoula, just a whole bunch of things that are happening on these on this part of land that they're developing moving forward. But the neighborhood overlay is to basically make sure that the neighborhood doesn't look manufactured. It looks uh, very much like it fits in with the area's aesthetic. And that's what the neighborhood overlay was passed a couple years ago to kind of help reflect. Heather Harp reflects on folks reluctant for the fast-paced world of development in the city of Missoula. And this is what she had to say for my last quote. People who really wanted to do a good project. And it, we realize that we here in Missoula don't always have the finances personally to be able to finance such a big project. And so sometimes it requires outside firms coming in to do some of that heavy lifting for us. I know a lot of Missoulians sometimes get upset about that idea, but at the end of the day, we need more housing. And so sometimes we just have to be able to work with others. Well, that's it for your city council report. Um, they voted in favor of Heron's Landing subdivision annexation and overlay and other word. Uh, there's a lot of this property um, kind of all around the city of Missoula, county being annexed and stuff like that, but developers would jump on. Um, they want to plan on doing this early as 2020, most likely in March, early spring, just sometime around that. Of course, for more information and to get in contact with your local government, you can log on to ci.missoula.mt.us uh, for permits, potholes that need filling, uh, pruning for trees and upcoming meetings and agenda items. So those are some of the, uh, some of the things that the city of Missoula does. And like I said, the website is a great resource for you. All right. So that concludes my city council report for you guys. I have, uh, another video from the, uh, Missoula city county health department. Uh, here's Cindy Farr. Uh, she, says that she's going to be start um, increasing the amount of videos being used. They went from being weekly, and now she might have to start doing more so because Missoula's seen one of the highest increases in COVID cases, one of the biggest spikes. So without further ado, here's Cindy Farr from the City County Health Department. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr, and I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Wednesday, September 23rd, and this is my COVID weekly briefing. First, I just want to let everyone know that as we're seeing increases in cases, we are going to start increasing our um, briefing, so you can stay tuned for that. Uh, as of today, we've had 656 cumulative positive cases of COVID in Missoula County to date. That's up 122 new cases in the last week and 17 new cases since yesterday. We've had 491 recoveries and three deaths. Two Missoula County residents and three non-county residents are currently hospitalized in Missoula County. We now have 162 active COVID-19 cases, which is up, 91, up from 91 active cases one week ago. We've currently identified over 720 close contacts. Those active cases and their close contacts will remain in isolation and quarantine and they're being supported as needed. The state of Montana is reporting 10,912 cumulative cases, which is up 214 new cases from yesterday. There are now 2,237 active cases with 124 active hospitalizations across the state. There have been 165 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. We are now posting the UM associated daily uh, da data daily to our website. In the past week, we've had 34 new cases associated with the University of Montana, and there are currently 48 active cases associated with the UM. 
As indicated by our case numbers, we're seeing a very rapid increase in COVID-19 activity in Missoula County. Our active COVID case rate per 100,000 people is currently at 101, which is nearly double from the 58 that we were reporting last week. The state of Montana as a whole is seeing 244 active cases per 100,000 people, which is up from 198 last week. Our reproductive value in Missoula County is still holding just below one, but we're anticipating with the rising cases that we will likely be over one by the end of this week and will likely be the highest that we've seen so far in this pandemic. We are continuing to see the largest source of exposure as close contacts to a confirmed case. So that brings me to our next topic. I would like to revisit some of the basics as I've been getting uh, quite a few comments and questions in the past week about some definitions. So let's start with some basic definitions related to infectious diseases. An epidemic is defined by the CDC as an increase often sudden in the number of cases of a disease above what's normally expected in that area. An outbreak carries the same definition of an epidemic, but it's often used for a more limited geographical area. A cluster refers to a group of cases in a place and time, and a pandemic refers to an epidemic that has now spread over several countries or continents, affecting a large number of people. When we're contact tracing, we speak with the person who tested positive, and we do an in-depth interview to determine who they've been within six feet of for a cumulative 15 minutes or more. That means that if you were within six feet of someone for five minutes at a time on three separate occasions while someone is contagious, then you would be considered a close contact. When you're identified as a close contact, the health department staff will contact you to let you know that you need to enter into quarantine. Quarantine means that you need to stay at home and not interact with anyone else. You will need to be quarantined for the full 14 days from the last known exposure. We at the health department then facilitate testing as long as it's been at least three days since your last exposure. The reason that we do that testing is for early identification of new cases. Even if you test negative at that point, you still need to remain in quarantine for the full 14 days because a negative test just means that you are negative in that moment on that day. It doesn't predict whether you're going to develop symptoms later in the incubation period because remember you can develop symptoms anywhere from two days after your last exposure to 14 days after your last exposure. So let's say you were not following the quarantine order and then you go on to develop symptoms, you will have exposed everyone that you had contact with for two days before you developed symptoms. That's why it's really important to follow that quarantine order. For those who test positive for COVID-19, you should remain isolated at home and away from others until you're released from isolation by a staff member from the health department. We follow the CDC guidance for determining at what point you're no longer contagious and you can return to your normal activities. I've gotten a lot of questions from schools and employers asking how they know that it's okay for someone to return to school or work after quarantine or isolation. At the end of your quarantine or isolation, you'll be offered a letter that gives you the date that you are released and you can then provide, provide that to your school or your place of employment so that they know it's safe for you to return. I also just wanted to let you know that DPHHS, under the direction of the governor, is publishing to their website each week on Wednesdays a list of schools, including elementary, middle, high school, colleges, and universities, and their number of cases. So if you go to dphhs.mt.gov and then go to their COVID demographic page, you can find a link to that report. Lastly, I just want to remind everyone that we are seeing a significant spread of COVID-19 at this time. It's really important to continue keeping your social circles small, practicing social distancing whenever possible, and washing your hands frequently and wearing that mask. Remember that this is not a case of stranger danger. We're spreading it to each other at this point. We're giving it to our family, our friends, and our coworkers. So it's really important to continue practicing prevention when you're around anyone who's outside of your immediate household. So that's it for my weekly briefing. Um, as always, you can subscribe to me on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. Click that notification bell so you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page. You can um, call 258-INFO if you would like to schedule a test through our drive through testing facility. Um, out on Flynn Lane. Um, you can also call that number if you just have other general questions about COVID-19 that you would like to get answered or you need to know what resources might be available to you in the community. 
Um, and you can check out our website at missoula.co slash cvirus for the most current and up-to-date numbers and information. So until next, next time, everybody, stay healthy. Hey guys, welcome back. Like I said, we're going to be looking at a little bit more of like kind of the smoke, upcoming smoke. There's still a lot of fires happening in the western part of the United States, but so far there's a lot of um, um, better um, air quality in the in Missoula. Um, today's air quality is healthy. It's in the green. Most of uh, uh, eastern Montana is looking a little uh, moderate to unhealthy for sensitive groups, but for the most part, the rain has done us good this week. Um, we I, we should expect more smoke if there's less rain, but it is also raining. Um, it rained uh, Thursday, and hopefully that'll carry on into this weekend as well. Um, but in the United States so far, there's been more than 7,500 buildings destroyed, uh, 37 deaths. The cost is $1.7 billion. Um, and total area is about... Uh, six million or six point six million acres, which is uh, it's uh, there's over a hundred fires. These are all different fires. They're working on containing a lot of them, which most of the time the uh, fire department and the hot shots do really well about containing the fire and containing the spread of all those fires. And they've done so much to help people. Um, there's a lot of support through the United States. A lot of money being put into this to help uh, prevent. Uh, further spread of these fires. Uh, Oregon is still, um, I, I'm not sure exactly if they're still in that evacuation order, but so far uh, weather conditions, uh, this is just, just definitely a lot going on. I don't want to get too into it, but um, we're just kind of, Montana's kind of been fairly lucky when it comes to the fire season. There hasn't been too many fires in the state of Montana, um, but we are uh, reeling from a lot of the western fires in further western states, Washington, Oregon, and California, which is getting hit the hardest. Um, but let's uh, look, let's kind of leave that there. You guys can look up more information on that as well. You can go to Montana DEQ for your air quality report and more. Of course, you can always Google Missoula's air quality and to see how many parts particular particulate matter, which is uh, PM two point five. It's it's light, but it's also thick enough to do some damage and um, affect people, um, especially if they're sensitive to air quality. All right, let's talk about more MCAT news. Um, so far, I've been hearing that um, things are going pretty slow in terms of opening the new public library. I've been there, been in there a couple times um, helping um, our general manager, Joel Baird, with trips inside the new library. And so far, we haven't had uh, been able to have any kind of big move over there and we've only been kind of limited to two people moving in a couple things weekly we have two hard hats and um <laughs> we it's uh, uh the library requires that you have to have a hard hat to enter the building so that's kind of like where we're at because we can't ha we don't have too many hard hats for a lot of people to move a lot of mcat stuff in there but we got a good chunk of our stuff in there already um right now um from what i know at the latest is that we're still looking to add Get, purchase the lights for the light grid in our studio. Um, so far, we removed a lot of the stuff in the studio so they can um, put in a carpet. So they're going to be putting carpet into our new studio as well. Um, there's a lot of sound dampening um, walls inside of the new studio, which is going to be really cool. Um, I can't show you. I can only tell you that it's a really cool area. Uh, a lot of office space for uh, us workers and a nice little uh, lounge area for people to um, kind of hang out on the computer. Um, and also we're going to have a bunch of kiosks where MCAT is. is there's going to be a lot of laptops, G Google Chromebooks <laughs> are going to be provided to people who have library cards. Um, the whole idea is that the kiosk, you put your library card in, you take the computer out, and you're supposed to have the computer on for a second amount of hours, but I, there's just so much to talk about in terms of the new library and how the new system's going to be working. There's no de facto computer lab, which is different from the old library. They're just going to let people uh, take a computer anywhere into the building um, and just kind of go from there. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what's going on with MCAT news. Um, but one of the things is that MCAT is doing is that we are continuing doing sports. Uh, we are attempting to do some more live streams, but very small live stream kind of events with uh, sports. There's not a lot of guarantee that we're going to be doing all the sports live, um, especially the sports that are so far out of uh, Wi-Fi range. Um, but we are going to try to be doing a couple live streams. Possibly um, tonight's football game we'll try to live stream. Uh, but if there's rain, we might want to limit that as well. So um, I'm talking a lot, a lot about this and that. Um, but for more information from MCAT, you can log on to MCAT.org. Um, it is your source for asking MCAT to do uh, upcoming broadcasts, upcoming shows that you guys have planned. Uh, we're doing a couple of social distancing shows for the Zach happening pretty much most, most Saturdays in October. So you guys can look forward to that. Uh, most starts times are at 7.30 p.m. And we'll be live streaming um, through them, uh, the Zootown Arts Community Center. So we're the power behind the uh, the Zach, and they'll be streaming on their Facebook, YouTube, and we'll be also streaming on MCAT's local live page, which can be accessed on the website. All right, I'm talking too much. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp.